and I'm going to share my screen. And then, so Chris and Mel, you guys could stay unmuted. Uh, so you guys could chime in once uh, we kind of get rolling. So, okay. So you guys, uh, and uh, Mel, if you, if anyone um, starts to kind of roll in late, just um, let me know and I could add them, uh, add them in just in case some people are coming uh, later. Okay. Um, Cause I'm not going to be paying attention. So uh, I'm coach Gaglione. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm not as strong as Chris, uh, but I do have, I have had some, uh, had some success in powerlifting. Uh, most notably, as far as my own iron cred, I've done a 900 pound squat in competition, 575 bench, a 660 deadlift. And uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only known man to squat 800 pounds in six weight classes. So kind of like, that's like my kind of claim to fame as far as myself, but more notably, I've helped over 80 lifters to get nationally ranked in the sport of powerlifting. Uh, and I'm much better coach, so that's kind of why I'm here to chat with you today. And we got, uh, you know, Chris on the line for his experience. So one of the things I always like to kind of lead off is a Louis, uh, famous Louis Simmons quote: uh, "If you walk with the lame, you will develop a limb." So I just appreciate you guys coming on today and just and uh, just being around other positive, like-minded people. It's really important that you surround yourself uh, with stronger people and smarter people than yourself. Uh, if you're the smartest person in the room, or if you're the strongest person in the room, you're probably in the wrong place. So. Uh, it's really, really important that we kind of come together and kind of connect with people that have more knowledge, have more wisdom, have more experience. So I, I'll give you a pat on the back today uh, for coming on the call and taking time out of your day to learn. So I'm going to kind of let uh, Chris maybe uh, chime in a little bit. And I have some kind of my own thoughts on this. But uh, basically, there's three main ways to get strong. You can lift something heavy, you can lift something fast, or you can lift something for reps. Pretty simple. Uh, you're going to work your strength, your power, and doing some bodybuilding. So maybe, uh, Chris, if you want to, um, I'll, I'll kind of give my take on these, but if you want to maybe talk about um, what these methods are and then maybe how you personally incorporate some of these methods into your own training and maybe some. Yeah, so, so we're obviously not, so John and I obviously, you know, we're coach powerlifters, we coach athletes, but coaches are going to do things a little bit different. So uh, actually, I'm, I wanted you to go first, and then I was going to just kind of explain my differences Sure. in the way that I, you know, go about these three, um, these three methods and how kind of I implement them so that I figure that they can see the, the differences. Cool. And while there's differences, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm right and he's wrong or he's right and I'm wrong. It's just that there's, like John said, different ways to skin a cat. And there's a lot of different ways to get strong. It's just a matter of implementing it properly and, you know, making sure you're doing the right thing. So while while we may share some differences in our, in our programming and our methodology, it doesn't necessarily mean that one's right and one's wrong or one's better and one's worse. Yeah. And one's I think, um, and I think also part of it is also like kind of a, the application to the, the lifter. So one of the things actually, Chris, that I m had mentioned uh, before we got up, before you got on, I talked about, um, cause one of the, one of the questions that we're going to, uh, that came up uh, that we'll, we'll answer at some point. We don't need to answer now. People were asking about like, well, how, how do I know how much band or chain to use? And I, and I kind of made the comments. Uh, I made the comment that um, I'm like, well, if you're Chris Delafave, I mean, you're going to use a, a crap load of bands, you know, like, <laughs> uh, I mean, you, like, I mean, those, those guys, I call them gods. I don't know if you call them Godzilla bands or whatever, but I mean, those things are like, unbelievable. I mean, some people probably can't even lift the bands with the empty bar, like, you know, so, but, but then I kind of also I'm like, but not for not, but you're a professional lifter for over a decade. And, close to a 900 pound puller and over a thousand squatter. So I think people kind of get really caught up with sometimes like trying to mimic what maybe you do or what like a Dave Hoff does. And you need to kind of maybe scale it down. Uh, Donnie Thompson's a great example. I always say like, anytime you learn something from Donnie, Super D, I love Super D, but unless like you're a 400 pound dude, it may not apply exactly. So a lot of times like the fat pad's a great example. I love the fat pad, but for some people it's just, it's just too wide. Um, right. But, that's right. A good, but, the, but the concept of having your shoulder blades being covered, I think is a great idea, but there's definitely a point of diminishing returns. So I think that's the same goes true for bands, chains, uh, reverse bands from like the ceiling come to mind where it's like, you're getting like, you know, oh, I did 1200 pounds reverse bands and the bands are doing a thousand pounds of help, you know? So those are <laughs> like really, like, those are more like extreme examples, but I think it's just kind of worth mentioning. I think no, there's. Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely going to be a point where it's too much. And what what I've come to realize is that that's going to be on a person by person basis. And it's going to be on a on a, an experience level basis, but also a strength basis as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I, I program all of my lifters with accommodating resistance, whether it's bands or chains, and I may give the same 
you know, general workout to everyone. Let's just say it's safety bar and, and chains, right? But I'm not going to have every single one of my lifters using the same amount of chain. That is where the personalization, that's where the individ, individualization comes in of person to person because someone who is a, let's say, a 600-pound squatter, they, they're going to obviously be using more chain than someone who is a 300-pound squatter. That's just obvious. So, yes, too much is not always too, too good. But, you know, if done the right way and, like I said, programmed and, and coached the right way, it's going to work. You just, have to trust, you just have to trust the process. I want to harp on that. And then I want to, because I think this is a, could be a whole a topic of discussion, but I do want to, <laughs> I want to make sure. So we're going to, we're going to get back to, uh, we're on a little bit of a tangent here, but I think it's a good one. Uh, I really like what Chris said. So I want to like, uh, you guys that are coaches, uh, there's a couple of coaches on the line. Uh, please take notes on this. Cause I think this is something that is missed. And it's something that I don't know if Chris has maybe caught, gotten flack for, but I know I certainly have. So one of the things that I know, like in the past that, um, that's been a kind of a knock on how we do things at Gaglium Strength is uh, the knock about a group training session is that everyone's kind of doing the same workout. But to Chris's point, it's actually not true. That's the thing. So when you do like something like a West Side program or West Side style program, you can have everybody doing the quote unquote same workout of the day, but by adjusting the chains, the chain tension, maybe the extra, like how you do the movement, Maybe someone's using a box. Maybe someone's not using a box. So a raw, a raw lifter might be doing a free squat. An equipped lifter might be doing a box squat with briefs. Um, you know, a, a raw lifter might only be using 40 pounds of chain, whereas the, the stronger equipped lifter might be using 120 pounds of chain. Or maybe they're not using chains. Maybe they're using bands or bands and chains. So even though it's the same workout on paper, there's so much individualization. So I think you get the best of both worlds. Everyone, I think people get too caught up with having a snowflake program. So and when I mean so, snowflake program, it's so specific to them, but they lose out on that group environment. And, and as Chris knows, it's like we, we thrive on that group environment. And I think that sometimes like that could be even more important than what's actually written on paper is just kind of being around other, uh, you know, I, a lot of coaches will say like you put a bunch of monsters in a room and you're going to create more monsters. So I think that is something that's kind of missing today with a lot of these newer lifters that kind of train alone. So the trade alone, yeah. So I, want I would, to, yeah. If you want I would to just, yeah, no, just, we'll just, to, to, just to touch on that. I mean, there's no way that I would be anywhere close to the numbers that I've hit in competition if not for the the teams and the groups that I've been around. You know, my my, my own, um, my uh, Mike Skiba team up at Hellbent. Like those, those are the two places where I train. And without my team at Burn County Barbell and Mike and those guys, like there's no way that. I would yeah. be anywhere close to, to the level of lifter that, that I am currently. And just even from a safety standpoint, that's a whole other thing. But I do think there is something definitely different about um, – and, you know, and there's like – whether it's the friendly smack talk or it's the cueing, I, I think all that stuff like really plays – All of it. The, the training yeah. – nothing beats a good training environment. Yeah, and I think the good training environment, honestly – because I think that is like if, – if Westside Barbell is anything, I think that's really like what – like is it the program – Eh, that's part of it. And we're going to talk about that, but I think that the creating that environment is probably the most important thing. And then, and then we can kind of start to kind of talk about the X's and O's, which we're going to talk about today. So uh, we're going to get into the methods now. Uh, so these are some tools uh, as far as, so uh, these are some tools that I kind of made. If you do have access to these things, uh, max effort, basically is something where the goal is to strain. So the goal is to lift something heavy. Uh, typically it's not the competition lift, but it can be but it's going to be something where you could strain. It's usually a variation of the, of the competition lift. Now, if you're an athlete and you're not a, a power lifter, this does not have to be a squat, bench, or deadlift. It could be something else. Like Joe DeFranco is a good example. Uh, he might, in the past, I don't think he does this anymore, but in the past he might do a really heavy like tire flip, or, for example, mm -hmm. or you could maybe do like a really heavy weighted pull-up if you're a wrestler. So max effort does not have to be squat, benching, and deadlifting. But in the sense, the powerlifting sense, usually it's going to be a variation of the competition movement. Something that's going to have a high degree of correspondence. So it's going to have a high degree of transfer to the competition movements. Uh, so usually something with a barbell is going to be used for max effort. And then also utilizing racks, pins, safety straps, depending on what you have. Um, things that you're going to be able to lift like out of pins or off of pins or off like straps. Those are some good options for max effort work. Um, I don't use as much accommodating resistance personally. Uh, sometimes I'll use chains for max effort work, but 
I really like a Thompson style squat, which we can kind of get into, but, but in general, I'll use it a little bit more either straight weight or reverse bands uh, personally for max effort work for, for myself and our team. Uh, for dynamic effort work, the goal is form and force production. So that's your time where you're going to really dial in your technique. I think people forget the technical component of it. You don't want to just lift something fast and sloppy. Um, you need to do it with intention and you need to do it with form. If you're doing a lot of repetitions, a sloppy form, it's going to like just mess up your movement pattern. So form and force production. Um, and you want to, this is where you're going to kind of use accommodating resistance. If you're an athlete, this could be plyometrics. This could be box jumps. This could be explosive push-ups. Um, we talked about weightlifting before. This is where you could potentially do weightlifting movements. The reason why I like jumping and powerlifting movements is that they're less technical, they're easy to learn, and there's less chance of kind of injury and there's less uh, kind of a learning curve. Even though the squat, the bench, and the deadlift are so technical lifts, the snatch and the clean and jerk are much more, they may take you 5, 10, 20 years to really learn properly. Whereas something like a box squat, like myself or Chris, we could probably teach someone a box squat within a matter of minutes. I cannot teach, I cannot teach someone a clean and jerk in a matter of minutes. It's going to take several months. Uh, I could teach someone how to do a proper box jump in a matter of minutes. So that's why we prefer to use powerlifting movements. We can still, by utilizing submaximal weights with maximal force, we can still develop strength, speed, power, and all these explosive qualities, which can be really important for sports and also allow you to push through sticking points. And then the last piece, uh, so as far as um, for tools, right now a good tool for repetition effort method is going to be your body weight and bands. Uh, you could obviously still use barbells and dumbbells, but if you don't have access to some of these things, so think pull-ups, uh, dips, push-ups, sit-ups, band triceps, pull-downs. So things that are going to be lower uh, risk, higher reward, things that are going to be more kind of for a pump and kind of work more muscular endurance, you're going to go closer to failure on the repetition effort. It's going to be more, uh, if you have a weak point, like in your triceps or a weak point in like your hamstrings, these are going to be done for higher reps and higher volumes. So Chris, are you, I don't know if you want to um, kind of uh, maybe talk about some of the, um, you know, anything else that you want to add to just like the methods before we kind of move on to. Yeah. So um, while we can talk about the methods all day, but our, if we want to focus more about the, you know, the now in the sense of the at home stuff, it, it really is going to come down to what you have access to. I mean, we can, we can write you up or, you know, a coach can write you up a workout in in a matter of minutes but if you don't have the equipment or the access to that equipment you know it doesn't really matter so i i think what from today for the time being at least your goal should be to understand the concepts behind each of the methods so that you can look and see what you have access to and then based on what you have access to try and figure out how you, you can apply them to the methods Right. Some people may not be able to do any max effort work. It, it, you just may not have the equipment to, to be able to do it. And is that going to set you back to, you know, when you first started and you're going to lose all of your gains? No, it's not. But what you need to do for the time being in the situation that we're in is understand what the methods mean, look at what you have, and then try to figure out how you can take what you have and implement them into each method. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Just talking about the, the methods, um, you know, me personally, I do things a little bit differently. Um, I don't really have a true dynamic day. Um, the way that I kind of coach things is you should be moving everything fast. No matter if it's the bar or, you know, your top set, you should be trying to create as much, uh, as much force output into those lifts as possible. So, you know, we throw our bands and chains on and from one minute, as soon as the bands and chains gets on, we're trying to move everything as fast as possible on our max effort days. So we're building that speed and, and that, that strength simultaneously. Um, I will sometimes have people do dynamic effort work. Um, but that's typically going to be on their deload weeks just to keep up what we do. As, as I said, it's a form building workout as well. You're generating force, you're generating speed, but you're also honing in on the, on that, on those technical things that sometimes may get overlooked on a max effort day. You know, I can't tell you all the, the, the videos that I see of people's speed days looking either one like garbage or two like max effort work. Yeah. All right. 
if it's a speed day, those are the two least remotely close things to what you want your, your, your sets to look like. All right. So you need to be focusing on technique and you need to be focusing on the little things that you may, that may be weak points for you, right? If you typically don't do a good job of sitting back and opening up on your max effort days, that would be a great thing to focus on and work on, on your dynamic effort days, because it's a, it's lighter loads, um, lighter percentages, and you're hitting it with so much more volume for so many more sets. Those sets and those reps are opportunities for you to perfect your form, right? If you're doing 10 sets of two and every single one of those 20 reps are ugly, right? You're not, you're not getting any better. You're just practicing a bad, you're just practicing bad technique. And that's the opposite of what you want to get out on that day. Um, and as far as the repetition day, the repetition Chris, method. Chris, before you go into that, I just want to ask yeah. like, how often, or I'm, I'm sure it depends on like how close you are to a meet, but how often would you kind of rotate in? Because we kind of actually do a similar thing, and then maybe I'll have Mel uh, chime in, and she can kind of uh, uh, verify what I'm saying. But we actually also kind of – we don't uh, – we have more of a deadlift focus day and a squat focus day, and we'll kind of rotate. Like usually if we're squatting heavy one, one workout, we might deadlift light or – vice versa, but we'll kind of rotate the dynamic effort work in um, throughout the month uh, as well. So how often would you say you're kind of throwing a speed workout in, in the equation? Um, so I either have people, depending on where they are in their, in their, pro, in their, um, their season, I'll, I'll either have them deload every third week or every fourth week. So depending on um, how that falls, if it's every third week, I'll usually have them, them do a speed day once a month. You know, if you're going to do it on, on a calendar basis, cool. um, if they're getting closer to a meet and they're deloading every third week, I pull dynamic. I pull all dynamic work um, leading in, during a meet prep. Yeah, because um, at, some, at some point you just need to like you're going to train more specific. It's going to be heavier. Correct. You're, you're peaking. So in West Side methodology, they kind of call that like a circa max. So correct. It, it ends up not being so that's, you know, a little bit more advanced. But yeah, I think so. So I think that's great. So we don't actually have a dynamic day either uh, anymore. We, we started off with like a more traditional four day split and then we kind of moved away from it. So we're, we're kind of in the same boat there. So then let's, uh, let's kind of go into the repetition effort method. Uh, and then so for me, repet my repetition method, I take that and I do that on a whole separate day. So for me, I, I, I've done it two ways. I've done it a straight squat day and a, and a straight deadlift day as let's just say are my two lower body, my two lower body days a week, or I've done a squat and a deadlift like you, and then an accessory lower day. And that accessory lower day is, is what I would consider my repetition day. And that's my, you know, bodybuilding S hypertrophy volume, weak point training, um, not necessarily using any type of competition lift, but movements that are going to strengthen the muscles that are going to make my competition lifts better. So one thing that I hate seeing is somebody figuring out that they have a weakness and instead of directly addressing the weakness, they choose a movement that should possibly address the weakness. So for example, let's say someone has a, a weak upper back and they fall and their, their shoulders round forward when they're squatting and when they're pulling. Some people may do some type of, let's say, um, you know, rounded back good morning or something, something along those lines where me personally, instead of doing something like that, where it's, it's a much more compounded movement where other muscles are going to come, come into play. I'd rather just target that upper back directly, whether that's heavy, direct dumbbell work, heavy direct or you know volume with bands but i want to hit that upper back from a muscular standpoint as opposed to a movement standpoint if that makes sense cool i think that's a great point i think sometimes we get too cute with trying to have this like really weird exercise to like correct the imbalance and sometimes it's just a matter of hey like your hamstrings like suck so let's just do some hamstring curls. And like, let's oh, just do some ham. Let's just do <laughs> some hamstring curls and some extra glued hams. And uh, let's yeah. do some RDL. Yeah. Instead like, of you know, some like crazy reinvent, things. Yeah, we don't need to like reinvent the wheel with some of these no. like exercises. Um, I'll I'll tell you that's been something that I've noticed more and more. Like just kind of you know doing some more bodybuilding focused training right now. It's like, oh like, 
you start to kind of figure out really quick, like, oh, I, my shoulders really suck or like whatever. And I think uh, Dave Tate was famous for saying like, you know, if your delts, you know, bench 270, uh, if your belt of uh, your, sorry, if your shoulders bench 315, your chest bench is 315, but your triceps bench 275, you bench 275. And so like, Correct. Yeah, once you kind of, if all, if everything like, if you have one weak link in the chain, that's you're going to suffer. So once you can kind of find that weakness, and those things could potentially change, or for some people, it's like you may always like your upper back may always be kind of lagging behind your legs, or vice versa, and you just that's something you always kind of have to constantly attack. But um, you know, I know like I'm sure like with you as you advance as a lifter, you know your strengths and weaknesses and your muscle kind of groups are, are definitely gonna uh, gonna ch change as a result. And and also if you're an athlete, uh, you know you're your your needs and your demands might, might might be different as well um cool anything else to add on the, on uh the accessory work um uh, sorry i was muted i look at my accessory day like it's a bodybuilding day uh when, when i program it i'm thinking of i'm thinking of all of my lifters as a whole what's going where are the majority of people weak so majority of people have weak upper backs and typically weak hamstrings and we, you know, weak, weak chains. So uh, my upper, my upper body accessory day is trying to minimize those weak points and everyone's weak points are going to be a little bit different, but everyone is going to benefit from a bigger and stronger upper back, a bigger and stronger, bigger and stronger lats, bigger and stronger glutes and bigger and stronger hamstrings. Everyone's going to benefit from that. So if you can just kind of figure out or, or kind of hone in on where your, where your weak points are, you got to attack them directly with height, with volume and hypertrophy, as opposed to figuring out a movement. Again, that's my standpoint of it. You could, you may ask 10 other people and they may give you 10 other answers, but that's just what I found works for myself and for my lifters. And I would say like to like, every, you know, like, you're not Louis Simmons. I'm not Louis Simmons. Like, I mean, he may be able to figure out some weird exercise that may work for someone. Right. But for mo just keep it simple. Like, figure out like something that's like that you know is going to work that muscle group that's weak. And I think in general, if you kind of work uh, the backside, like most people's kind of posterior chain is going to be weaker. So if you're kind of working everything that you can't see, that's a gr a great place to start in terms of your assistance work because a lot of people um, that have you know. What do most gym bros usually do? They do a lot of curls. They do a, a lot of chest. Uh, they do a lot of quad work. So usually that stuff is kind of – usually people have a foundation in that kind of stuff as already. Not to say you can't do it, uh, but in general, I think that's great advice. So this is Pro Plim's chart. Uh, this is where some of the, the kind of – the 10 sets of two, the, uh, you know, five sets of five, three sets of one. This is kind of where that stuff – but basically all this is kind of showing is that as intensity is increased, as you get closer to 100%, your optimal and your uh, target repetitions are going to be less. So if you're working in the 90% range, you're going to obviously use less total volume. And if you're working in a lower percentage range, you could, you could handle more volume. So um, if you're doing submaximal weights, so if you're doing like under 80%, you know, somewhere between like 15 and 25, 30 repetitions total is going to be good. So 10 sets of three, five sets of five in that range and things like that. And then once you start to get like 85, 90, 90 percent, your your workout's probably going to be like under 10 reps. And if you if you're someone at like Chris's strength level, or like when I'm getting ready for a meet, you know, even doing three or four singles at like above 90 percent, like you're smoked like after that. So I don't know if you want to. I'm tired. Uh, and I think like to your point, uh, there's something I've been doing a lot too. Like a lot of times, like after I'm like done squatting, uh, let's say I'm in my suit and I, let's say I do like an 8:30 squat with reverse bands as a workout. I might be like kind of done after that. I might do some belt squatting, go home, and then I'll do my accessories like the next day. So there's nothing wrong with kind of breaking it up and kind of doing it like that too as you get stronger. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about in terms of like sets and reps or or just training volume and things like that. Because obviously like you got to take into, into account intensity, but you also need to take into account absolute poundage and neural fatigue as well. So like if you're in your squat suit, handling a thousand pounds versus doing a beltless high bar squat with 500, the intensity may be similar, but the fur fatigue you're going to create is going to be like way different when you're in your suit versus just doing like a, like a, a light raw squat, you know? So, yeah, I mean, the one thing that I've kind of harped on with, with all of my lifters is always err on the side of 
lighter to start, you can always do more work. You can always do an extra set. You can always add another set. That's not going to kill you. You know, if your rep, if your total range may go, maybe it's 32 because you, you know, you erred on the side of going too light to start. That's not a bad thing. All right. I, the worst, the worst possible thing is people taking huge jumps, you know, during their workouts and, and missing or things getting ugly and it, and it blows up the whole workout. It kind of defeats the purpose, right? So whether, whatever the, the, the goal of the day is, if the goal of the day is to hit a heavy single, all right, try and get a decent amount of singles in to get your volume in to match your intensity, right? You can, if you're a 500 pound squatter, you could go one play, two play, three play, four play, five plates in theory. But you've only done five sets and you only done five, and if you took a single at each set, you've really only done five reps. You're not really building anything. Okay, so what's what's really hurting you from going one plate, two plate, three plates, three and a quarter, four, four and a quarter, five. Now you've almost doubled your workload by just taking quarter jumps instead of plate jumps. Right? All of that is gonna kind of add up in the end, like what John said about total poundage. Yeah. And I always use the example, like I always like, you know, Dave Hop, like he, it, and it's kind of annoying sometimes if you're ever in the warm up room with him, but like, he'll put like 95 pounds on the bench, like, and he'll like warm up very slow and very methodic. I don't know if he does that anymore, but I remember like one time I was at a meet, a uh, local meet that uh, we were competing in the same meet and he's like, you know, thousand pound bencher and he puts like a quarters on the bar. So I always say if Hop can put a quarter on the bar, then, then you guys can. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, think I think that's important. Um, I think it's important to understand that there's going to be, I loved what you said, like, what's the intent of the day? So if your intent of the day is to test yourself at, or at, if you're at a meet, like, yeah, take those jumps so you conserve your energy. But if you want to build volume and you're just trying to get a, if, it, if you're training to build the lift, take some smaller jumps and take your time. You get more practice, you get more sets in. Um, there's nothing wrong with like taking your time and just getting some more extra work in. Um, on game day, yeah, like you're not going to have as much time. You're not going to be able to have the time to warm up and take 10 sets to warm up. But in a workout, yeah, take your time. Make sure your technique is right. You know, build up slowly. Get the volume in. I think that's, that's great advice and understand the intent of the day. So uh, I just wanted to share two examples with you guys on some different ways you can kind of split up the training. This is something we did a lot with our athletes. So we would do like a three-day split. And we'd have like a lower body emphasis max effort day. At, uh, um, sorry, I'm, yeah, so we might have a, a lower body emphasis, upper body emphasis, and a total body emphasis, and usually that'd be a dynamic effort. Um, so you could do upper, lower, total, or you could do total, total, total. So this is like one way you can kind of break up your training for three days a week. Uh, this would be usually something I would do with athletes or people that just don't have a lot of time to train. And then this is more uh, traditional, like West Side Split, uh, where we do like an, a max effort upper, max effort lower, a dynamic effort lower, dynamic effort upper. And then what we, what we do typically, what I do right now is I'll do a squat focus day, a bench focus day, a deadlift focus day, and then I'll do like a secondary, like more bodybuilding style bench day. And that might turn into a speed day uh, as I get closer to a contest. Um, and then usually like if I'm going really heavy on a squat, I'll usually go like lighter on the deadlift uh, and vice versa. And then like to Chris's point, as you get really, as you get stronger, you might rotate through squat and deadlift on your heavy day. And then your secondary day might be like a more of a bodybuilding. Day. So I don't know if you want to talk about like how you split up your training with your people or. Um, so, yeah. So I've done a couple things. I'm actually trying something a little bit new now. Um, and I've got some positive feedback. Um, obviously I can't really tell cause there's no real meets going on to see, you know, numbers and things, but the, the markers are looking like things are working. Um, I've been, ha been having everyone do a full, true max effort lower squat. And after there's going to be volume, there's going to be working up to a heavy, you know, max effort lift. Then I've been adding extra volume after that max effort. So kind of like I said, while there's three different methods, they don't have to be done in three separate days. So what I really have is I have a max effort day combined with that, combined with the dynamic day working up you know, building speed. And then after that max effort, some rep work. So it, you know, in one, in one workout, they're really getting three, three yeah. quote unquote. Yeah. You're, you're okay. training all, all different qualities in the same. Correct. 
Um, and then after that, after that rep work, some accessory work, but nothing too crazy. So there's right now I'm not having any deadlifting done on my squat days. Um, max effort bench, you know, depending on raw or in a shirt, really doesn't matter. Um, you should be training your raw side, whether you're in gear, regardless. I harp on that all the time to everybody. You can't just throw gear on with 135. That's just how I, my stance on it. Um, then on my accessory lower body day, what I've been doing is I've been having, I've been putting in some type of pull variation, but not max effort, a volume day. So like five sets of three or three sets of five or three sets of three or, you know, two sets of four or something like that against bands and chains. And then I have them continue right into their accessory work, um, their volume, their, their higher end hypertrophy work. Um, you know, again, weak point stuff. And then my fourth day is like I talked about a basically a bodybuilding upper body day, uh, focusing on weak point training. Cool. It's great. So I think it's just kind of important. Like, again, we talked about to go back to what we said before, understanding the principles and then kind of like when to apply them. And this stuff is great. I think honestly, like as far as if you, if you are training athletes or if you're an athlete yourself, not like a competitive lifter, um, this stuff would be, I think is great for CrossFitters too, because a lot of times you, you got to be ready for everything. You got to be ready for reps. You got to be ready for heavy. You got to be ready for endurance. So all this stuff can apply to many different sports. Uh, and then this was, yeah, this was, uh, yeah, we talked about max effort, upper, lower, total. So that's another, so those are some three examples. And then Chris's example. Uh, so this is that, something. J John, yes. just, just to be. You're good. Oh, I did. Okay. Um, that three-day split is ideal for athletes. Yes. Ideal for athletes. So any athletes in here. Uh, if you're confused about how you should be going about your, your training or your programming, um, number one, if you are confused and you have the resources, I would definitely reach out to some type of coach um, who has some kind of experience background in whatever they're talking about, um, not just Instagram followers, because that's not how you should pick your coaches, FYI. Um, but that setup of a program is ideal because you, you, even if you're in season, you do need to be maintaining your strength. All right. Don't let any don't let any of your coaches tell you um, that be, just because you're in season, you shouldn't be lifting. That's ridiculous. And ignore them. Um, make sure that you are at least maintaining all of that strength that you built up in your off season while you're an in season athlete. Yeah, that's a great point. And then one thing it's like one thing that always, would always drive me nuts about some of these football coaches that would kind of stop their training like comes like August. It's like you're in like the best shape and best condition for like your first game. Right. It's like, <laughs> it's right. like, it's like, who cares? Like, it's not like it never like, made, it never made any sense to me. It's like, why don't we're worried about, we should be worried about playoffs. Like you want to peak for playoffs. So understanding like when you need to peak and when, so I think a lot of people like if you're peaking for like your preseason game, then you're not, you're not doing, you're doing something wrong, you know? So you're doing a disservice. Yeah, so I think that's uh, that's a great thing. So I want to just kind of go over. Um, we talked about kind of when to incorporate the speed work and things like that. So in a more traditional sense, um, if you're doing kind of a more linear progression in terms of like your volume, um, you might do a speed work or some sort of reduction in volume every fourth week. So this would be an example of like how that might look visually. So in your fourth week, uh, typically we, re we recommend a 50% reduction in volume. Uh, and or intensity, we usually tend to keep the intensity still fairly high, uh, but our assistance work and our like uh, total number of repetitions will drop by. So if you're doing five sets of five, for example, as like your main work, uh, then you should would be doing one or two of two sets of five, for, for example. And let's say you're doing like, let's say you're doing 100 total reps on like your tricep press downs, you might do 50 total reps on like week four. So this is just one way that we could like kind of look at how a deload might look from a visual standpoint. And then as our athletes get more advanced, we kind of do something like this. So a lot of times uh, week one and three will be fairly challenging in terms of volume and intensity. And then we'll actually have a slight drop in our workload on week two and a much bigger drop on week four. So week two, sometimes a lot of times is we'll do um, kind of a dynamic effort workout on that second week. So we get like a little bit of a break, but we're still working on technique we'll hit it really hard in week three and then we will have like a bigger deload on week four. So these are just some different ways. This is more an undulating model that you can kind of structure like your volume intensity and workload for, 
whether it be your main lifts or your accessory lifts, but uh, you definitely don't, you can't just increase linearly all the time. You do need to have some breaks. So I just want to kind of show that from like a visual standpoint. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, every fourth week. It could be every three weeks, it could be every four weeks, it could be every, but I would say in general, somewhere between three and six weeks, you should have some reduction in volume and some reduction in intensity. Uh, that way you don't uh, plateau and you don't have injuries. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about the frequency of deloads, Chris, or anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyone who does not deload, you're, you're setting yourself up for either injury or a headache because you're going to start to see your, your progress plateau, as John said, and probably, you know, head, head the other direction. Your body needs to recover. Recovery is very important. So I, I would say anything more than then five weeks, you're almost, you're almost kind of teetering that line. I know some people give that three to six week range. I, I don't have anybody go more than, more than four weeks, more than four weeks straight without a deload. And that's, that's for a couple, couple reasons. One, you got to give your body a break. Two, you got to give your, your mind a break, right? You, you got, you got to, you got to let yourself relax a little bit. You can't always be at 95, 99, hundred percent training. Right, you're gonna eventually, you're gonna eventually hit a wall, and there's eventually not gonna be that, and that we want to continually see progress. Now that progress could still come after a deload, right? It it's it's all wrapped around training and programming, but deloading is very overlooked, and it shouldn't be because it's very important. Yeah, and I think uh, to Chris's point, like you're better off deloading early. And deloading late. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, so, like, you, like, I rather err on the side of like do it a little bit earlier, feel fresh. Because when it's too late, sometimes you might be like setting yourself up back like even a couple of months. I know I've kind of like uh, been dealing with a shoulder thing for the past year, and it's like if I would just took a deload instead of like trying to do an extra bench workout, I would have saved myself probably six months of, and I probably would have like you know hit a hundred pounds more in my total like when we when we competed together in December. So it's just like, and I was just from like one stupid mistake, you know, and it can really cost, especially as an advanced lifter, that could really cost you um, a big time if you don't deload, uh, you know, when you need to. So, yeah, uh, this is just some, uh, this is just some examples of some different programs, uh, you know, that you guys could like look at quickly um, based on like what equipment you have. So we kind of, you know, uh, it's just some kind of, you know, you can kind of see there's some fluctuation in the kind of the volume and intensity, like in week two and week four, there's like a drop in either volume or intensity. Um, there's a supplemental exercise in there. There's some assistance work at the end, uh, looking at some weak training, like, you know, single leg training and some upper back work at the end. Um, we'll talk about some specific exercises, but I just want you to kind of just get some examples. That's a sample max effort workout. Um, that's over a month period. So you guys can just kind of take a look at that. Um, so you have some singles in there and so heavy work, and then you have some, some more volume at the end. Uh, this is an example of a upper body kind of cycle. Um, again, not for any particular lifters, this is an example of kind of applying some of the methods and, and things like that. So again, you have some upper body work that's heavy, and then you have some supplemental exercises, uh, based on kind of weak points and just minimal equipment. And then uh, one thing, yeah, one, just to, just to jump in. Um, you guys see uh, in John's programming that all, for his max effort work, a lot of stuff is based off of percentages, all right? That's one way to go about how you determine or, go, or figure out your max effort days. Um, another way and the way that I, I use it is I use uh, the RPE method, uh, rate of perceived exhaustion, I think. That's the E, right? Exertion, but yeah. It's yeah. Just Exertion, exhaustion, whatever. Same thing, same premise. And the, the, reason, the reason for that is I want my lifters to not so much focus on a number, but focus on how they feel. So I don't want to – and I'm not saying that, that, that I'm right and John's wrong. I'm just saying that we do – like we said in the beginning, we do things a little bit different. So this is just one of those differences. Um, and the reason why I do that is I don't want to say to have a lifter say, all right, you got to work up to 80%. But now let's say they're, ha they're feeling great. They're having a good day and 80% looks like an absolute joke. All right. In, if you just cut them off 
right, they may have lost a set or two that they could have built upon. So uh, instead of giving a percentage, I give a, I give a feel or, or a number out of 10. I base everything out of, out of a 10. So my max effort work is always on my, on my true max effort days are going to be around a 9, 10, meaning, meaning there's no misses, right? The, the one thing I don't want in training is a miss, right? So I say 9, 10 because if you, you take a set and it feels like you're pretty much done, I don't want you to try and take another set. I want you to call it right there because that's how it felt, all right? Um, so when I'm, looking, when I'm looking at a lifter in person, right, it's a little bit easier in person because you can see it in real time. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at two things. I'm looking at technique and I'm looking at bar speed, right? So if, if, if my lifter's maintaining good technique and the bar speed is fast, right, I'm going to say that they probably have another jump or two left in them, okay? They may feel that it was heavy, right? So I'm going to take that feel into consideration with their jump. But by me, by me seeing it live in person, right, I can say, all right, maybe we could take a small jump. Or maybe it was real easy and we'd take a big jump, right? So that's why I like to base things on feel and that RPE method as opposed to percentages. Yeah. I think no, not, not right or wrong, just – various very and, and, and just for context like we'll like we'll utilize usually both i just like to so uh um just to kind of uh piggyback off that i like to have a certain percentage in mind if if we have a if it's a competition lift i want to kind of work in a certain range but uh to chris's point if, if the intent of the day is to like leave uh we'll usually use more of the terminology of like reps in reserve but it's essentially the same thing a one in the tank essentially is like a nine RP, same, same difference, but um, just terminology. But essentially, what is the intent of the day? And you do want to kind of adjust by feel. Uh, and I will say to Chris's point too, like knowing the lifter is super important because if someone's more of kind of a grinding type lifter versus an explosive lifter, um, what you visually, knowing the lifter is really important because someone like, uh, you know, like a Larry Williams, for example, he could have a very small deviation in this form and they could still look very fast. And that was it. Like, that was like, he doesn't have another 10 pounds in him. So um, I know Chris is really explosive too. So sometimes it's like, you need to look at bar speed and also technique and know the lifter. Are they more of a grinding lifter where they kind of work on one speed, like from 80% up? Or do they make everything look really fast and they miss really quick? So I don't know if you have any like um, thing to add about like that. Because I know some people are kind of, again, more grindy, more explosive. And some people can kind of like operate at a much slower kind of speed and kind of keep putting on like another 50 or hundred pounds um, before they actually top out. So that's kind of why I'll, while I'll, I'll use like the visual of actually seeing the lift, but I'll also ask, like I'll immediately say yeah, one I, out of I, 10, I, give me like one out of 10 right now, give me a number. If, if, if there's a question about the next lift and that's just something because I, then I do that for two, for two reasons. One, I want to see where their head's at. Right, I, I want to know how they felt about that lift and where their head's at for their next set. If someone goes, oh, that was easy, that was a six. All right, I'm, they, they're feeling good, it looked good, it moved well, let's take a bigger jump. But if someone says, I don't know, felt kind of heavy, right, then, then you know right there in their mind that, that they're already, they already have a problem because they're feeling the weight is heavy. Yeah. Right, two, a person can take two, take the same exact weight, and on one day it could feel re real light, and the second day it could feel real heavy, and that's just based on a lot of you know outside factors, rest, nutrition, you know, a whole bunch of other things, sleep. Um, so it's always got to be, it's it's got to look good. Number one, I'll never let somebody take a jump, regardless of what they say it felt like, if it looks ugly. Right, my big thing is. In order for you to get strong, your lifts have to look pretty. Yes. Right? They got to look pretty. It's a lot easier to get a pretty lifter strong than it is to get an ugly lifter strong. And I think uh, you just start to, you start to ingrain if, – if it's like uh, – it's the same thing in sports. the same thing. It's like you kind of um, – you fall to the level of your training, right? So when your back's right. against the wall, if you're used to doing max effort work sloppy and then when you get to a meet and you have to strain for that third rep, that, that third attempt grinder – the, you're kind of dead in the water at that point. You want to train your body to kind of be in those good positions, even when it's heavy. So uh, I think that's great to kind of treat, treat everything like a skill. Uh, this is more of an athletic type day. I wouldn't do this with a power lifter, but this is something that we kind of do with like our athletes. If we're doing like a total body day, we might like kind of box squat, speed bench, 
and then do assistance work after. So this would be more kind of an athletic type, longer like kind of speed workout. So this is another example of a dynamic uh, day that would be kind of total body. Um, and then again, we, we, we have some weightlifting in there we have some, throughout the week, and then we have some assistance work. So again, sub-maximal reps, maximum force, good technique. Uh, we do that's a total body explosive day. Uh, in terms of testing yourself, uh, right now, I believe, so this, this is some things, that, this is just kind of some discussion points here. Uh, I believe like in terms of like testing yourself, if you kind of want to test like your power, you could obviously test like using like a, some sort of jump is a great way to kind of measure your power for an athlete. Deadlifts, a great way to measure your strength. And, ter and ter right now, you don't need a spotter, obviously, to test your deadlift or do a max effort lift. So if you're going to push one lift right now and you're by yourself and you don't have a spotter, I would advise that pushing your deadlift a little bit more than your squat might be a good idea. And then also you can think about doing maybe some overhead pressing too. Again, it's going to be a little bit safer than benching right now. You don't get pinned under it. So if maybe you want to incorporate that as a max effort lift. So I would say, I don't know, if Chris, if you have any other ideas for lifts that you could potentially push, uh, but I'm thinking like if you could overhead press and deadlift, you could do some variations for your max effort work there. That way, if God forbid, does something something happens, you kind of just let go of the bar and like you're okay. So maybe some ideas for people that want to kind of push some of the heavier lifts by themselves uh, right now. Deadlift. I mean, again, kind of like kind of like what we said at the beginning. It's really going to come down to what you have access to. Um, I mean, and that's kind of obvious. If you don't have a rack, right, then you're kind of limited. You may have weights, you may have a bar, but if you don't have a rack, you're kind of limited to what you can do. So. You, you got to kind of look and see, all right, I have a bar, I have weights on it, I have dumbbells, maybe I have a rack. All right, what can I do in this rack that I can do safely without a spot but still get work in? All right, that doesn't, you don't necessarily need to do something heavy to get good work in, yep. right? You can, you can add something a little bit different that still is going to make the lift hard and make the lift challenging but not going to need – four, five, 600 pounds, all right? What's a very, if, you're, if you want to squat, that's fine. Pauses, right? Do pause squats, right? You're, if you're going to use a lighter weight, right? You're still going to get the work in, but it's not going to be as heavy, right? Or pin squats, something like that, where you set up the pins and you can pin squat to below parallel if you really want to. If you miss, you just leave it on the pin. Um, but Deadlifting, you can stand on bands if you have access to it. Um, if you don't want a bench or you don't have a bench, but you have a rack, you could floor press, right? A little bit safer because if you do miss, you just kind of dump the bar and the weight, weights won't, shouldn't hit you in the face, hopefully. Um, you can, like John said, you can shoulder press. Uh, you can bench if you want. You can bench with pauses. You can, you know, bench with negatives. You can tempo. You can add tempos. You can add multiple pauses. Like there's different things that you can do to for right now that can still get max effort work done safely. So when I, you just got to be creative. It, yeah, I wanna, well, I wanna, the situation okay. that the situation that we're in is going to call for creativity. Yes. So I want to harp on a couple of the uh, great ahead, ideas sorry. That, uh, that Chris mentioned just to kind of read. So t adjusting tempo in terms of having a slow negative. Uh, adding isometric either pauses at the bottom or at different points in the lift. So adjusting your tempo is going to be really important to make the lifts a little bit more challenging. Uh, also adjusting tempo is a great way to kind of work your technique. If you ever done like a pause deadlift at your knees or something like that, if you're in a bad position, it just feels awful. So if you do a, like if you do a pause squat, it feels awful. So you kind of, you get feedback right away if you're in a good position or not. So like something like a photo press. Uh, I liked what Chris said about floor pressing. You, it's unless you have like a really big head, I guess you really can't like hurt yourself. Uh, it's going to like kind of hit the ground. It's not going to like hit you in the neck. So floor pressing is a great exercise at home. Even if you don't have a rack, you can kind of like shimmy the bar into, into a good groove and, and get you can. It, it's not, not too challenging actually. Uh, and then deadlifting. And then we talked about um, pause squats and things like that. So if you're able to front squat, if you're able to do like a snatch grip deadlift, if you have like, I would use do straps with that. Like, Deficit deadlifts. So do exercises that maybe increase the range of motion uh, to make it a little bit harder. And then, like Chris said, you could also use if you have a power rack, you could also use pins and do concentric only work. You're doing a suspended good morning, a, a rack deadlift, uh, a pin squat, a, a dead bench press, a pin press, 
all these are great uh, ideas for max effort work. So, uh, and then I think doing body weight like chin ups is also a good way to kind of keep your, a uh, good way to get assistance work in and get your, and keep your body weight in check. So I just want to chin ups, push pull ups, yeah, push ups, dips. I mean, pull ups, push ups, dips. You can do awesome, those anywhere, awesome anywhere. Like, yeah. So uh, just to kind of recap some of the different, uh, some, some of the different options here. Um, and I kind of just noted like what method you might want to use it for. So something like a high bar squat or a pause squat, front squat, front loaded squats are going to be great right now because they're going to make it harder. I know Mel's been doing a lot of Zercher squats. Uh, so if you don't have a rack, doing like a Zercher squat, like, you know, could be a good, good option for you right now. Uh, box squats are going to be great for dynamic work or max effort work. And then the pin squats can be great for max effort work as well. Uh, this is some good assistance work ideas. Any type of single leg work is going to be really great. You don't need a lot of load to do like a Bulgarian split squat, especially if you're doing like a slow tempo and you can just use your body weight so you can really smoke your legs with single leg work. So Bulgarian split squats, reverse lunges, step ups, all those are going to be great uh, for assistance work for the lower body. And it's going to help prevent. Guys, some everyone. Yeah, sorry to cut you off, John. Um, in the situation that we're in, everyone should be focusing on single leg work. Yeah, absolutely. Because it is always overlooked and it is always thrown by the wayside when you're in your, you know, your normal gym with your normal group doing your normal stuff. You sh everyone should be implementing some type of single leg movement at least once a week to fix all those imbalances. Cause even me, I have imbalances too. And I've noticed them even a lot more because I've been doing a lot more single leg work. And uh, if you want to also do some posterior chain kind of dominant stuff, you can kind of just do the same movement. So right here, picture is a Bulgarian split squat with the back foot elevated. If you lean over more, you can make it a little bit more glute dominant. If you want to do that, if you do have access to a 45 degree back extension or glute ham raise, you can do a single leg uh, back extension as well. I don't really like single leg deadlifts because I feel like people can't do them well, but a single leg back. Extension, I like single leg. I like single leg RDLs. Yeah. Uh, especially I like them if you use a kettlebell and you kind of, uh, yes. you can kind of give you a little bit more balance. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's a great movement as well. Um, and then we'll kind of get into this, some hamstring stuff, but single leg work is going to be really important during this time. So I, I agree with Chris. This is a great time to, I think we're all kind of guilty of like not doing any single leg work during a peaking phase. So it's a good like kind of thing to kind of add in right now. Uh, so we talk about lower body exercises in terms of deadlifting. You can do a Romanian deadlift, a straight leg deadlift, a deficit deadlift. You can do work on your opposite stance, your sumo or conventional. If you're a sumo lifter, I do think doing conventional in the off season is going to be a good idea especially if you're weaker at it, now's a good time to maybe throw some conventional work in. Um, any ideas for like other like deadlift? Uh, John, I haven't done any sumo deadlift since the Arnold. There, there you go. So, and Chris is eight. I minutes. haven't done any sumo yeah. pulls since the Arnold. So there you, there you go. So doing the work on your options. So I'm doing all conventional work. Perfect. Perfect. So that's coming from a close to a 900 puller. Uh, this is some other options for uh, hamstring work. Uh, chair deadlifts, suspended good mornings, good mornings, uh, glute bridge variations, single leg. Um, any comments on good mornings, Chris, and like how people kind of uh, do them incorrectly or like how you might, how you might utilize, utilize them? I don't really so do them I don't do I, them anymore. I only will do like higher reps if I do them or do like a lot of band good mornings and things like that. Me personally, I don't do them and I've actually never done them. Um, just me personally, I've always had a much stronger lower back than hamstrings and glutes. So when I do a good morning, my lower back takes over that immediately. So I don't want to put even more strain and work on my lower back than I normally would. So I, I, I do not do them. I do have, I do banded good mornings and I will sometimes implement some like seated good mornings if I want to get some like mid back work done. Um, but I, me personally, from what I found, they don't work for me. I do program them though for my lifters, but not for max effort work. I won't have them do any less than like six reps. I typically keep it in the eight to 12 range. Just, and I, and I usually have them do it with the safety bar. Just, it's just easier. Yeah. Um, because I, I like the movement itself for, for certain lifters that don't have that low back, um, that low back strength, because it is a good builder there. Um, it just needs to be done correctly. Easier said than done. Um, I personally, for myself, I got up yes, to the point, very true. I, I, I got up to the point where I was doing like um, 
you know, 600, uh, 600 pounds in the morning for like five reps. And at that point, like to me, like the risk wasn't worth, worth the reward anymore. Like it was just right. like, you know, I just, so I, I like to do more like weighted back extensions, glute ham raises and band good mornings and things like that. So to Chris's point, if you're going to use good mornings, I think higher reps and to keep them strict is a, a good like kind of rule of thumb for, for, for that. Exercise. See, for, for me, and I know a lot of guys implement good mornings as a max effort movement. For me, I always, always, always have my max effort movement be some variation of the competition lift. So if, I'm, if it's a squat day, we're squatting. We could be box squatting or free squatting. It could be a straight bar. It could be a buffalo bar. It could be a camber bar. It could be a safety bar. It could be bands. It could be chains. It could be a, you know, a parallel box, a below parallel box, double, singles, whatever. But it's going to be a squat. And I, don't, I never understood not doing the – not always practicing the competition lift in some form. I just – I never – that never made sense in my yeah. mind. I think it starts to get like when you start to get like two or three changes away from the competition lift is the transfer just isn't there as much. So it's just not there. And be, because I, I that's great. You know, I've seen people good morning, 900 pounds. That's great, but they couldn't squat 900 pounds. So what's the point? Yeah. So I think you got to ask yourself like, what's the correspondence and if there's not like a high correspondence and that's kind of right. like what I found was my, my good morning is like worse now but my squat technique is better. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's kind of like, but um, anyway, so I think that's a good, uh, good discussion there. So there's some other, we talked about having the floor press, uh, push-ups and dips are going to be great uh, for, uh, for up, upper body uh, dynamic uh, repetition work, uh, feet up benching, close grip benching, pin presses. And then we talked about for overhead work, uh, push pressing can be great for athletes for like uh, dynamic work as well. In I like, I really like the incline press especially for raw lifters. Uh, it, mm -hmm. If your shoulders can tolerate it, dips are great. Um, that could be an option if you have like a playground near you. Uh, overhead pressing if you don't have a rack. Um, so that's going to be some great options for upper body training. For upper back work, obviously all types of pull-ups that you could do and then all types of kind of rows that you could do. Uh, anything that you want to kind of comment on in terms of like training your upper back, Chris, or training like rows or uh, like lats and things like that? So I... I've done, I've done it both ways. I've um, had a separate, just straight back day. And then I've also done where I do a little, where I program a little bit of back of with every workout. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at, where I'm at now. Um, so I'll implement a, either a, some type of back pull or back. Um, well, it's always a pull, but some type of pull with every, with every, um, with every workout. So I love, McGill pull-ups. Can, um, like, can you explain to people what that is that aren't familiar? Yes. Um, for, for those who don't know, uh, they're, you know, fam famous after um, Dr. Stuart McGill. He's a real famous uh, back guy. If anyone has any serious back issues, definitely reach out um, to Dr. McGill. I think he's up in Canada. Uh, but he fixed uh, Brian Carroll's back. Yeah. So the and, book, the book uh, is called The Gift of Injury. Yes, um, it's a really good resource. Um, so if you guys are interested, definitely check. It's a good uh, book. Yes, yeah. and what what the way that he kind of explains it is the majority of people once they start to get tired, their pull ups start to suck. Obviously, so instead of doing let's say three sets of ten of pull ups, he recommends to do thirty sets of one. And what what the reason for that is is that every single rep is a fully contracted max effort explosive pull up and by doing one at a time you are making sure that you're you know you're working what you want to be working you're not cheating you're not kipping you're not doing all that all that other jazz and you're, you're targeting what you want to do um, so the correct way to do it I'm sure there's videos online uh, but the correct way to do a McGill pull up is you actually load your lats uh, from the hang and do a pull up from there um, if you've never done it before I highly recommend trying it because number one they blow your back up i do like four or five and i already have a back pump and it's pretty fantastic um but i also saw that when my when i was able to do more consecutive mcgills i saw my bench go up too so i saw a translation there i think um there's a couple of videos of actually Stu mcgill uh 
t- actually putting Brian Carroll through. Like, it might, yeah, I've, I've definitely seen that video. So if you guys can find that video. Yeah, um, if, you, if you YouTube like McGill pull up, it'll come up. But, but essentially like, if you kind of think about like the application, it's, it's almost, almost like a dynamic effort pull up. It's a, dyna- it's a dynamic effort pull up. Yeah. And you're going to do multiple submaximal efforts. And um, I'll tell you, I would say pull ups probably more than anything. Even strong guys, like after a couple of reps, it just gets sloppy. So, I mean, if you do them really strict and dead hang, like one or two is good. Like it's going to be like a lot, especially for bigger guys. And uh, man, it's like you really get a good contraction. And when you think about squatting, benching, and deadlifting, I don't want to. It's all back. I don't want to train, and I don't want to train my upper back in like a bad position either. So I want to kind of train in that. I know Chris always talks about with the bench, pinch and tuck. So you kind of want to finish in that pinch and tucked position when you finish that pull up, as opposed to kind of that sloppy kind of rounded upper back position. So that's kind of where the um, the thought process is. And so I think that's a really great. Um, so doing things like that, I think doing things like a lot. I do like a lot of um, a lot of my back work. I'll do like kind of chest supported. So I, can, I, I was just gonna say so. So my my three big my three big back movements that, that I that I like myself and that I that I program are McGill pull ups, any type of chest supported row, whether one arm two with ISO hold you know seal chest supported whatever however you want to do it, and crock rows. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, it it's really just load up as much weight on a dumbbell or grab the heaviest dumbbell that you have and do as many reps as you can um, until you can't do any more. Just, uh, and that was – how um, – sorry. I, I don't mean to cut you off because I know – so, again, one of those things. So, again, Matt Krasileski, Krizal- uh, you know, was former all-time world record roller, 220, made these really popular. When you do them personally, Chris, like how much like, body English do you use or do you kind of – A lot. Okay. A lot. I want – so what I'll do is I'll let – when I'm doing the, when I'm letting it come down, I'll let it pull my shoulder forward. So letting it stretch. So that I can get a little, so I can get that stretch and then really focus on driving my elbow back, not pull with my hand to really throw my elbow back and really get that, that lower lat, um, that lower lat involved. So common mistake when people do those is that they kind of use their bicep too much. Correct. Not really pulling more. So if you think about, like Chris said, think about your elbow driving back and pulling more towards your hip. So getting that big stretch in your lap, letting your shoulder blade kind of come forward a little bit, and then kind of pinch and tuck and finish with that chest proud. That's a real. Even if you're using a little bit of body English and you're kind of getting your legs involved, you're going to still be practicing a good finished position. So I think that's really important. You're not just sloppily pulling with your arms. So that's that's kind of no, no, and that's and that's, and that's, that's, that's the, the big that's the big dif, dif, difference. I like a little bit of body English on those because if you need to use a little bit of body English to go to squeeze out, you know, 10 more reps, that's 10 more reps. I'm okay with that. All right. But you need to make sure that, that it's your lats that are pulling. It's your upper back that's pulling and not your bicep because one, you don't want to lose a bicep doing crock rows. That's, that's dumb. And two, you want to make sure that, that you're going through all of that and you're actually hitting the muscle groups that you want hit and that you want trained. You know, you can do 300 rows, but if they're all ugly and you're not hitting your lats and your upper back, then what's the point? You know, make sure that, 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 that there's a, a – you figured out that there's a reason to do them, that you need a bigger back and bigger upper back. Great. But do it the right way to actually translate into getting a bigger upper back and bigger back. That's awesome. That's really good. I think that's well explained. I think um, if you guys like learn anything, like that's just, just that like last like five minutes talking about like how to like actually train your back. I think that's like super valuable for like anyone. Because I think a lot. I think that's a. I think a lot of. Well, you know this, Chris. Going back to, um, I think a lot of powerlifters like of this new era, they probably don't even do any lat work, like zero. It, it's incredible. Zero. It's incredible because I, I distinctly remember going to competitions in you know the early the early 2010 so 2010 11 12 13 14 and dudes would walk around and they were just ginormous and it wasn't like it wasn't like they were at you know big chest and big arms yeah. their upper back and backs just looked like like chunks of meat and i was like i need that i need a back that just kind of yeah. like hangs like 
like the like the Balboa steak that he would fight in the freezers. Love it. Right now I go to meet and nobody has any back or upper yeah. back. Does yeah. nobody pull? I don't understand. It no doesn't one make does. any sense to me. It's like, have you ever heard of like, a, like even like a lat pull down? Like, let's do something. Like, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like, but. Like, but, just, uh, just do some kind of row. Yeah. Your yeah. shoulders will love you if you do a row. Yeah, I think, um, I think, yeah. I mean, yeah, even just from a, health, a shoulder health standpoint, if we're only pushing. From a shoulder health standpoint alone. Yeah. Just to balance it out. But yeah, I agree. I love, I think, um, I, I like, I love, I, I kind of same thing. Like looking at like someone like, you know, uh, Chuck Vogelpohl was someone that I, I'm sure like. Uh, yes. hundred percent. Like look like when he would kind of turn around and, and kind of get ready for a big deadlift. I mean, it was like, Oh my God. So that, like that to me, like that's, that's the kind of stuff that gets. He me. was wide. He was wide this way, but he was also like wide this way. Yep. Yep. Like yep. this way. I like the thickness of his back was incredible. I'm pretty sure that he like pulled 800 with like a broken rib too. <laughs> he did. <laughs> but he did. uh that's sad. If you have a strong back, you could you could figure out a to, you can figure it out. That's uh but anyways, a little uh so we can kind of talk this is another big topic, but maybe what's your kind of take on direct core training and like do you do any or like what's your your thoughts on that? Um okay, that's another thing that I'll that I'll put in. Um with every workout so like what i typically do if you, if ever, anyone's ever um if you, anyone were to look at my workouts there'd be your you know let's say if it's a max effort day there'd be your max effort work a little bit of volume after that your hypertrophy uh your accessory stuff and then core and lat work and a lot of that accessory stuff and a lot of that core and lat work is all supersetted because i don't want anyone to be fat and sloppy i want everyone moving around yeah. i want everyone going like supersets, short rest periods on, on the, on the accessory stuff. You know, I don't mind if a lifter is going to take a couple minutes or, you know, the, 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 the group is moving a little bit slow during their max effort work, but once their accessory work kicks in, I'm, I'm in there. Like you got to go, like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And no, I, I always familiar. have them do <laughs> what I was saying, Mel, does this sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so I always have, um, some kind of core work and some kind of back work at, at the end of every workout. And what I, how I typically set it up is on my heavier, on my lower days, it's either some kind of weighted uh, plank or some kind of heavier movement. Um, so, you know, a weighted plank, side bends, uh, like a 45 degree uh, sit up, something like that, where they can do, you know, four, three to five sets of eight to 12 reps, treating it like, like you would treat any other muscle group. Um, and then on my upper body days, I give it a little bit more, a little bit more volume. So maybe like uh, banded crunches, uh, weighted toe touches, uh, Russian twists, um, you know, hanging leg raises, stuff like that, where, you know, we're getting a little bit more volume on the, on the, on the upper days. We're work, working the core a little bit heavier on the, the lower body days. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I think there's, um, at least in the fitness world, there's kind of like, um, argument whether you should flex your spine or not. And I you know if you actually, if you look at like, like Brian Carroll stuff, like he won't, I don't think he'll do any like kind of flexion or anything like that. So, um, I think that doing some flexion exercises where you're kind of bending your spine is okay. Um, but I would recommend you do those. If you're going to do sit-ups or leg raises, I recommend you do them very controlled and not use a lot of momentum, actually, uh, put tension into your core and like, don't be just swinging like on a bar, like actually like use your abs to just like with the rows, like you want to use your lat to do the row. You want to use your abs to do the leg raise. You want to use your abs. Guys, to do you're the, think of it this way. You're doing this work. Like you're at the gym, you're doing this work. You're, you're paying a coach. Like they're writing, they're writing you a program. You might as well do it and put, you know, do it correctly so that you're getting the most out of it. If you're doing core work. Yes, guys, I know I get it. Core work sucks. No one wants to do any of that stuff. We understand. We all, we all get it. But that could be the difference between yes. staying, staying vertical with a 700-pound squat or a 700-pound squat lawn chairing you. Yep. You know, at the bottom, right? Your core is your most important thing that you have as a lifter, right? So that's got to be treated like the most important thing that you have. You need to be able to brace. You need to be able to, you know, build that 
that, uh, you know, build that, that core around you so that you can be tight, locked in, and be able to control weight. So without, if you neglect that core work, you're neglecting the biggest piece of your foundation. So I know like super, Donnie Thompson will kind of refer to it as like your, your, it's your trunk. So like you want like yeah. literally like if you think about like a tree, you want, it does, it's not really maybe aesthetically pleasing, but the best power lifters, they have a thick midsection that's stable as hell. Like you can't move them. So like they're not going to be able that that spine is not going to buckle no matter like what the weight is. So if you watch the best squatters and stuff, I mean, it's like, I mean, they're, it's pinned straight. Because if you get forward a little, you could ask Chris, you could ask my, you know, if you get forward with 900, 1,000, you're done. You're done. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. There's, no, there's no, like, coming back from it. I mean, and literally that could be the difference between smoking the weight and getting, like, your head chopped off. So uh, the core work is, is tremendous. And so uh, having some controlled spinal flexion is a good strategy. And like Chris said, also some not planks for two minutes, actually challenging planks to train that brace so you don't want to be hanging out there for two minutes that's not going to no, be no i want i want someone to put a hundred pound plate on my back and and do it for 30 seconds yeah and squeeze and brace as hard as i possibly can with a hundred with 200 with whatever just and you know really really brace and load everything and and build that that core cool. to and that trunk like donnie said because if you can stay vertical on a, on a squat and you know that your chest isn't going anywhere, you're head over heels, of, you know, better off than the majority of other lifters. Amazing. Great stuff. So uh, we're going to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to stop the share right now. Thank you guys for uh, – so let's go, we're going to open the floor to Q&A. And then what you could do is I believe um, if you click the space bar, I believe you guys can raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, so if you have any questions or you could type in the chat box as well. And then um, I know uh, just, I know Joy had a question, Chris, so we could start off with this one. If you guys are sure. able to, um, when would you, when, when do you know if, if a lifter is, is ready for bands and chains? That was like one of the questions. Okay. So me personally, I have, I, I, if I take on a new lifter and when I say new lifter, I mean someone who's never, never done power lifting type movements before. I won't graduate them to bands and chains until they can competently and without any hesitation do the movement, just the movement without any issues, right? So if, if a person who's never squatted before can complete a box squat or a free squat, whatever, and it looks nice and, it, and it's consistently – pretty and technically sound and there's no glaring issues i will introduce bands and chains at that point but very 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 light so maybe a micro mini band or 20 pounds of chains so or you know maybe even less you know 10 pounds of chains something that is adjusting that strength curve and you know getting them to the point where you know we can use more but it has to be done intelligently. You can't throw bands and chains on onto a lifter that can't move the bar without proper technique. So it's all going to be based on, you know, one, how, how, is, how is the lifter's technique from a visual standpoint, right? Also, it's going to be how comfortable is that lifter under the bar, right? So if, if, no one's, if someone hasn't used bands or chains before and you just throw on a band, that's a completely different feeling from just straight weight. So someone who's new may not be ready for that, you know, that feeling yet, that added tension at the top of the lift on the unwrap, right? Because that's where the bands are the hardest at the top, right? As you squat, the bands are decreasing in tension. You come back up, there's the band. So that initial pressure may be challenging for some newer lifters to, to get used to. Okay, that's fine. So what, what do we do in a situation like that? We don't start adding bands and chains or heavier bands and chains. We keep the bands and chains minimal and then slowly start to add bar weight. Then the top, the weight at the top becomes more. They're, they're used to that weight at the top. Then you may be able to add a little bit heavier band tension, decrease the bar weight, keep them a little bit healthier. Awesome. I'll give my take on that, but I thought Chris summed it up really well. Um, I think number one, I think to harp on what Chris said, 
uh, the technique of just like the competition lifts needs to be there. So you have to have a foundation in your form for the squat, the bench, and the deadlift first and foremost. Uh, a good kind of recommendation, and these are just very general. Um, you never have to use bands and chains, but I know like myself and Chris, we just, we like them. I think they're fun. I think they're a useful tool. I think they look cool. So uh, whether it's a novel stimulus, I, I do think, um, so one of the reasons for those that are unfamiliar, bands are kind of a form of what we call accommodating resistance. So in the case of a bench press, a squat, or a deadlift, as you get closer to the top, your joint angle gets closed and you become stronger mechanically. So as the you get mechanically stronger, you get more tension or more weight from the chain or from the band. So that's why it makes it actually makes the exercises more mechanically efficient. So even if you're not a competitive lifter, it's just a great, it makes the movement kind of mechanically better from a physics standpoint. Um, so I think it's just a great option in general. Um, if you th think about though adding chains to like um, a, a row, for example, or bands to a row, you're mechanically weaker. So it's not as efficient. It doesn't mean you can't do it, uh, but you're not going to get the same benefit as you would adding chains to a press or bands to a press. So I just want to kind of clarify just because you're adding bands or chains, it doesn't necessarily mean it's accommodating. It depends on the exercise and it depends on how you set it up. Um, I would say in general, I like to incorporate chains first because they won't mess with your movement pattern as much. Uh, bands, if they're set up incorrectly or if you're, if you're not ready for it. I think band tension is harder than straight weight personally, even if it's lighter in the bottom, especially when you're starting out. If you've ever picked up, um, you know, 300 pounds of band tension, like that is like, you know, uh, it's, it's 300 a, pounds of band tension is, it feels a lot different than 300 pounds opposite. of bar weight. So like sometimes the pick, just unracking the squat uh, with bands is the hardest part. So if your pick is a weakness and it, a lot, oftentimes it will be for multiply lifting. I think that's why banded squats are so popular for multiply lifting because oftentimes, sometimes the, the pick is the make or break point is like, can you unrack the weight with conviction? Can you unrack it correctly in good position? So I like to incorporate chains first. Uh, and then at some point reverse bands, we, and I know myself and Chris, we do like to do some reverse bands, uh, like in a peaking phase. I think it's a great way to kind of build confidence and kind of feel the weight and just visually see like, okay, but my goal is to squat 900 the meat. Like I've just kind of seen that on the bar before. I, I think there's something to that, not even just from a physiological standpoint, but just being, okay, I've, I've felt it. I've seen it. Even if maybe if the bands are helping you a tiny bit at the top, just the fact that you've kind of felt it before, I do think that there's something to it. And then I, you know, so that's one of the things that I like. And we don't like to take third attempts in the gym. We'll usually do like third attempts with a reverse band just for confidence. Uh, and then we won't really go again to 100%. Um, so usually uh, chains first and maybe reverse bands. And then uh, usually bands from the bottom will we'll start to incorporate more for advanced lifters. And as far as how much, I think in general, um, using it, like let's say if you're, if you're like a four to 500 pound squatter, somewhere between 80 pounds and 100 pounds of chain weight or band tension is probably a good place to start. So usually somewhere between 20 to 25% is a good place to start. It doesn't mean you have to. Now, depending on what the intent of the day is, do you want to overload more? Do you want to work more power? Do you want to work a lockout position? So depending on what the intent of the exercise is, you can adjust up or down and do more. So an example of more chain weight, if you just want to overload and feel the top, would be like a Thompson-style squat. I'm not sure if you've ever done something like this, Chris. We'll, we'll, we'll go up to like 80%. So I might do a 415, and instead of adding bar weight, I'll just add a chain every set until I work up to like, it might be 700 pounds of total system weight, but it's only 400 pounds in the bottom. So it's very easy on the bottom, but you still get to feel that overload at the top. So that's like a different kind of workout. So um, so one thing, one thing that, that, I, that I've been harping on um, is if you can pick it, you can squat it. So, so there, there has been, there has been points where, and, and I understand that it's not, that it's not the same, but there has been points where leading into meets, we've picked over 1400 at the top in to in total, you know, yeah. as you used as total system yeah. weight. Yeah. So, you know, granted it's not 1400 pounds on the bar, but I felt 1400 pounds at the top. And I know if I can pick 14, then 11 should in theory, not feel as bad. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, you said 14, and then what's your best squat? Like 11, 1100. 11. Um, so 1100 times. I'm just curious if this like kind of works out. So, so 1100. Okay, it's a little bit more. So yeah, usually so the, so 1320 would be like a 20 percent overload. So that's mm -hmm. why it sounds like a weird number, but it's actually not. So we usually we'll say like uh, 20 percent, like 
like heavy pick is yeah. like, you know, so like if you're like a five, a 500 pound squatter, you know, going up to 550, 600, for example, might be a good place to start. If you want to do like a heavy on rack, great way to kind of train your nervous system uh, to handle heavier weights. So if you could pick, you know, if you could pick 600, if you do five, if your goal is 500 of the meat, it's going to feel like much more comfortable, like on your back. Yeah. Um, even if it's no, I, and I didn't mean, I didn't mean for 1400 in bar weight. I meant 1400. So I think we total, ended up using total, like, not, total system it weight. was like 900 pounds of, of AR. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that. I wouldn't recommend that. To no, I know. So we, else. I know. To anybody. Just don't, just don't, honestly, don't, I, don't copy I, what Chris does. Don't do that. <laughs> do not do that. I don't do that. You had the yellow bands on there. That was 1400. So that wasn't even the last that we actually took 15 and that's the max of the, of the Buffalo bar. Yeah. It started so to when I stood, no, when I stood up the, the, the ends bowed um, and I couldn't clear the mono. Jesus Christ. But that yeah. was, so f that was, um, <laughs> that was a strong band. No. That was two strong bands. So like 600-ish. Uh, a medium. And like 400 pounds of chain. Or no, it was, it was one strong, one medium, and 600 pounds of chain. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, no, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. Don't do that. You had two strong, you said? No, one strong, one medium, and 500 in chain. Or 600 in chain. Yeah, so it's about like nine hundred of commenting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I did my uh, my West Side math correctly, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. No, it and that and that's just kind of one of those things where I'd rather feel because I uh, the way that I the way that I do my um and my just, preps are a little bit different. And just for reference, like we, that's some, that's something that you were that was a a thing you were trying to work on was your pick. Right, correct? Yes. So my my issue was um, I had a lot of pick issues prior to me getting hurt back in 2016. When I came back, I, I started more uh, more towards the conjugate west side AR approach than I was prior to that. And a big part of that was to was to fix my pick issues. And 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 I think we're onto something with you know the, the crazier AR. Um, we don't typically go that heavy. Um, unless we're unless we're in a meat prep sure um that's and, that that was a little ridiculous but you know it made sense at the time well and i'll say too like when you get to the point where like i said i you know i've had a thousand pounds on my back before i haven't done it in competition but i've done like a partial squat with it so i've i've, I've felt it and um you know taking that all the way to the bottom, like week in and week out, it's, it's hard. So when you start, that's why these tools start to become more important. I believe as you advance as a lifter, because you don't want the stress of a thousand pounds in the hole all the time, but you still need to have your body be ready for it. So I think that's where like kind of the bands and chains becomes more of a useful tool as you get stronger, because you do need to be able to unrack the way you do need to be, your body needs to be ready for it, but you do need to find a way to like keep your body kind of, you need to like get to the meat in one piece too. So you need, you need to be in one piece, you know, you need so, to stay in one piece. So, so yeah, I like me personally, I can't handle nine, 10, 11 straight weight every week for 10 weeks leading into a meet. I'd get halfway through and I'd be done. Something would get hurt and I'd be, I'd be upset and cranky about it. Yeah. But so now. Like, yeah. Go get, go ahead. I'm just doing some math. Ooh, more math. <laughs> well, no, I was saying, so like 90%, um, let's say if you're a 300 pound squatter, like 90% would be 270. So like a 300 pound right. squatter could probably squat 270, like probably every week and be okay. Like, you know, like they could probably, you know, like they wouldn't, you know, but when you're a thousand pound squatter, you know, 90% is 900. And even though, yes, intensity wise, right. same thing, but it's not the same thing. It's, it's not apples. To, it's like, it's not apples to oranges. But we're talking, it's a different type of like apple, like, you know what I mean? So like, it's green like, apples to red apple. Yeah, ex exact, exactly. So that like you really, so the absolute poundage matters. That's one thing I want to harp on. Um, so when we're talking about deload. And I think it mat it matters so much for central, ner for CNS purposes. Yes. I think that's the biggest issue. And I think that's, that's overlooked by a lot of people is your CNS needs to be used to the weight, but it also needs to be recovered and firing it on all cylinders. 
If you're, if you're always crushing your CNS week in and week out with straight weight, straight weight, straight weight, straight weight, your CNS is going to be in the garbage real quick. Yeah. Cool. <coughs> I love that. So yeah, I think you have to, uh, muscular fatigue is a lot easier to manage. It's uh, more, but, um, if you've ever squatted in knee wraps or if you've ever squatted in powerlifting gear, you get a weird different type of brain frog and brain kind of fatigue that is not uh, of this, of this earth. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it is a different feeling. So I just, it's just something to kind of consider. Um, again, that spinal loading, regardless of if the knee wraps are helping you, the, the your spine still needs to support that load. So you need to, that needs to be factored in. So I want to kind of get to a couple of the other questions. Um, cause me and Chris can, BS all day about like, uh, you know, this, this, this kind of stuff. All day. All but, uh, day. Uh, as far as percentage use for deload, uh, depends on what we're doing. So th the biggest thing on a deload is that there should be a 50% reduction in volume. So whatever your volume, your, your average, let's say if your average volume was like 25 reps on a given exercise, you want to at least cut that in half. Uh, the intensity, sometimes we could, we could be, it could be higher. I would say maybe like a 10% reduction is fine, or you can keep intensity fairly similar. Uh, but like I said, if you're going from like a max effort method to like a dynamic effort method, for example, as a deload, it might be like a, a dynamic effort is typically going to be 50 to 60 ish percent bar weight plus some sort of accommodating resistance. But the main thing is it's going to be a, a, a reduction in volume. Um, so it just depends. But yeah, so I, as long as there's some, as long as you pull back, uh, when you're a beginning lifter, you don't need to pull back a lot, but even pulling back a little bit um, goes a long way. Um, Yes. Yeah, so now we got a couple more questions coming in. So Chris, anything else you want to add as far as like, uh, so the way, the way that I do my D, my D load dynamic work is I do it, um, 40, 45, 50, 55 and 60%. So, uh, typically, um, one to three sets of each one of those rep ranges. So they're getting a decent amount of volume. They're getting anywhere from five to 15 sets of, of, um, work in uh, i don't i don't do any i don't add any accommodating resistance during the deload because i do use so much accommodating resistance during actual training weeks so i i give them a break from that and there's you know and their cns a break from 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 the load by dropping it that low and i do that based off of their meat numbers awesome. so so someone who someone who may have competed you know, 12 months ago is still using old numbers, which means they're probably stronger than that, but they're even, they're, they're erring on the side of going lighter during their deload week. Cool. Uh, so we had two more questions come in to me. Um, you, I don't know if you do incorporate any sled work and if so, like how do you incorporate it in, into the routine? Um, I didn't at the other gym uh, because we didn't have the room. But now I, I might just because we have extra room. Um, so I don't typically, but sometimes I throw it in on a deload just to j honestly, just to change, th change things up and hit, and hit it from a different way. Um, and then um, Golan too, uh, definitely check out um, on my YouTube channel, uh, Mel and myself, we had a presentation on cardio training. We talk about incorporating sled training in more detail. Check that out because I don't want to spend like 20 minutes on it, but it could be used as an accessory lift or it could be used for blood flow and just recovery. So I'll just kind of keep it simple. Walk forward, I, love, walk I love sled work. I love, I like sled work for recovery purposes. Just get blood for, flow for, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Just walk, like, it walk doesn't even walk. have to be heavy. Yeah. Lighter, <laughs> light, lighter than you think. Yeah. Lighter than you think. Exactly. Just get moving. And I said, like to, to your point about the, we don't want to be the fat slob power lifters. Right. So I think that's, I, I think that right. that's that stereotype. So, it just kind of help you kind of stay in shape and get blood flow and just get, get things moving. Um, and so Ryan asks about ideal amount of sets for max effort work. What would be too little? What would be too many? And obviously it depends, right? But in general, like what would you, what would you say is like a good am amount of working sets for, for max effort? Work? So we kind of touched on it before. Like if you're a 500 pound squatter and you go one plate, two plate, three plate, four plate, five plate, you've only done five sets. And yeah, you may have worked up to hundred percent, but you've only done five sets to get there. So I don't think it's a number as much as it's a, how much work did you put in? It's a workload thing. You know, it's the workload. So for me, you know, it, let's just say I, I needed to work up to a thousand, right? 
that would be however many, if I took plate jumps, that's 11 jumps. So right there, I've done 11 sets. And the workload, but if I've only done singles, is much, but your workload is much higher than the, if you were to work up to 500 in plate jumps. Correct. Considerably higher. Correct. I've actually doubled, I've doubled the workload and I've probably a number higher than quadrupled the poundage. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it, I don't think it's so much a, it's so much a number as again like we talked about the goal of the day right if you're testing that's different right if 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 you're if you're programmed to go hit a one rep max straight bar straight weight test right then we want you to conserve your energy take bigger jumps you know say and leave it all out there for your test right but if if it's just a normal training workout and you're working up to let's say a heavy single against you know some kind of bands and chains there's nothing wrong with taking quarter jumps or taking 30 pound jumps to get more work in right so so i i do everything based off of rpe if someone said if i ask them how somebody how something feels and they say it feels like a five i'm gonna tell them to add a plate right but then once it starts to get closer to no, yeah. you know that seven eight nine number now i gotta gauge all right well you can't take another plate jump if it was an eight so why don't we take a 10 just to see how it feels? You can always take another set. You're allowed to use 10s? It's too easy. Hold on. You're allowed to use 10s? Only if you use 10 and 5s. Because that is 30-pound jump. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong just, with taking I, another set. Just, yeah, just kidding, guys. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> there, there used to be like – and uh, I've trained at Westside a few times. Chris, I'm not sure if you, if you have it, but like – uh, you can't even find like tens. Like you just like it's either no. it's either no, no, no. You might you might be you might be able to get away with a quarter like toward the end, but it's <laughs> otherwise it's just are we putting a plate on or not? It's plate. It's plate. It's just like uh, th well, in my, yeah. in my in um at Berg County Barbell they know they're not allowed to put chips on, <laughs> so so they either so they either have to take a five or they're done. So uh, yeah, I I like that. It's good. So um. I want to go over a couple. So I want I want to ask you one a follow up question, and I'm going to give a couple of examples for myself. So let, let, hypothetically, let's say you're working up to like 1,100 pounds reverse bands. What would be the two sets prior to that for you? Like, would you do like 1050, I, 950, or like what would like what would it, you know? I like to I like to stay in that in that plate jump range in that 90 pound yeah. in that 90 pound jump. Um, obviously, once you get higher up to that um, to that you know that max effort that 910 range. I may throw a quarter. So um, if I'm going to end around, let's say 11, the set before may be 1050, but the set before that was probably 940. Cool. Or 960, 960, yeah, it depends on like the, 1050. It depends on using a Mastodon or whatever, but yeah. Right, 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 right. I mean, you know what I mean? But typically it'll be, it'll be a, it'll be a 90 pound jump and then probably a 50 pound jump. 40 or 50. To, yeah. So perfect. Yeah. So I think now, if, and if we did the math to that, you're kind of like within, it's, it's, you, you're probably taking like, I want to say like um, somewhere between like an eight to 10% jump. And then it's like a, maybe a three to 5% jump, something mm -hmm. like that. But you're within like, you're doing three singles kind of like between 85 and a hundred percent. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of like, so once you kind of get past 85%, the jumps need to start to be smaller. So like for myself, I might go like, I might go like 750, uh, 790, 830 for like, for, for example, like for something, something like that. Um, you know, just for example, but in gym, but before that I'm taking a lot of plate jumps as well. So I think a good rule of thumb is the 10% rule. So if like you're a 500 pound squatter, probably most of your jumps are going to be around 50 pounds. If you're an 800 pound squatter, probably most of your jumps are going to be around 80 or 90 pounds. So if you're a 300 pound squatter, probably most of your jumps are going to be around like 20 or 30 pounds. So just, that's a kind of a good rule of thumb. And for max effort work, if you can kind of get three kind of challenging singles where the last one, your eyeballs don't quite explode, but they're but getting they're close, but they're getting close to exploding. Then that's a good, like kind of, uh, kind so of one thing, one thing, and I actually call it, um, I call it jump theory. I don't, I didn't, I totally made that up. It's your, your next jump can't be higher than your previous jump. Yeah, that, that's that's a really that's a really good rule of thumb. I like that. If you take if you take a a ten uh, let's say you put tens on, that's a twenty pound jump, right? And let's say you smoke it, 
all right? It would not make sense to take more than another 20 pound jump at that point. Regardless of how fast the bar moved, it does not make sense to take a bigger jump than your last previous jump. So that's why I say always err on the side of taking a smaller jump because let's say you try and put quarters on, you could get stapled. Cool. Um, I like that a lot. And it's it just, it's a good like to safety kind of net too. Yeah. I think, I think we've all kind of done that is we take a small jump and we smoke it and we get excited and we're like, throw another plate on, let's go. I yeah. got it. You know, it's like, I can do yeah. it. And then all of a sudden it's, it's like, like oh, and then you get like, and then staple. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that kind of like happened. Uh, uh, Lusty was helping me uh, pick my numbers at my last meet. And, uh, the third attempt, like I almost got it, but it was just like, dude, I wanted to take like a 20 pound jump. And he's like, put on, make a, a 50 pound jump. And I'm like, and at that point I didn't care. Like I was happy. All right, I, fine. So I'm like, sure. I'm like, just put it on. So I got it. But uh, I don't know if you remember what happened. Cause I know a lot was going on, but with like, you know, Skiba and everything, yeah. and like, you had to get the committee together. <laughs> but, but uh, so the side spotter, Chris grabbed one side. And of course it's my bad shoulder side. And they lip oh. when when Lusty handed me out, they they untucked that whole side. I thought Lusty just botched the handoff, so I'm like getting pissed. But then I watched rewatched the video, so they ended up giving me a retake. But I'm just like, listen, I'm like my shoulder's throbbing. I'm done. I'm like, I'm thank done. you. I'm like, let's move on to deadlifts, and then we'll have to warm up on the stiff bar. <laughs> but anyways, um, I think um, I don't want to. Um, so a couple of things, Chris. Uh, this was great. I will definitely have to do a part two. Uh, we definitely, we definitely, uh, we definitely will do an in-person event uh, once, uh, once uh, our government the world opens up, <laughs> once we're allowed to. Uh, so we will do an in-person event soon. So if you guys are interested, definitely let us know. Uh, but where can people find you if they want? It, if they're not already following you on uh, social, and the um, if they're not following me, it is on, on Instagram. It's uh, the underscore American Heartthrob. Um, there's also the gym page, Burn County Barbell. And um, and you guys are uh, gonna are you guys based at a Great White CrossFit right now? Yeah, we're in we're in Great White CrossFit in Hackensack, uh, Hackensack, New Jersey. Um, we've been there since the new year. Um, unfortunately, you know with everything go, everything going yeah. on, we're closed. But um, we're actually I'm actually in the process of maybe looking in, back into my own place again. So that's exciting for the future. We'll see what happens. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so definitely check out, uh, you know, Bergen County Barbell. I'm sure that you'll you'll settle on a home anyway at, at some point. And obviously, Chris, you know, you're always welcome. Uh, you know, thank to, you. To, thank to, you. Step to Strong Islands if, if uh, whenever whenever uh, whenever you like. Um, so and as well, if you guys aren't following us, it's at Gaglion Strength. Uh, if this if this podcast helped you, please uh, this webinar helped you, please give us a five star review. A review helps other people find us. Yeah, all five. If you don't, no less, no less. Got to be five. Um, and guys, if this like helped you, just like if you're if you're rewatching the replay, just share it with a friend. Um, you know, we're just trying to help other people kind of get strong and expose other people to different methods. So uh, we really appreciate you guys coming on today. Uh, please show your support if you want to. You know, screen screenshot this. You know, screenshot this. Tag us on it. We really appreciate it. Every little post bit. it, tag it, post it, and, tag um, it. Everyone appreciates it. And uh, yeah, definitely. Like I said, give 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 Chris a follow. And uh, like I said, just help support. You know you know, we're small, like local gyms and we, we need your support during this time. And like every, every little bit helps. So, uh, thank you guys for, for watching. I'm going to stop the recording.